It's okay. It's been a long day. Uh, the reshuffling of the schedule has uh, caused some challenges for all of us. Uh, and so I wanted to uh, apologize first for beginning this talk so late in the day. Uh, I'll do my best to keep it interesting and snappy and maybe we can have an interesting conversation about policy, which sounds like a contradiction in terms, but it really isn't. Uh, so let me uh, start by introducing myself. My name is Craig Peters. I am a program manager uh, at Microsoft working on Azure. At Azure, my responsibility is container infrastructure. So basically anything at Microsoft Azure that runs containers, my team is responsible for making sure that all of the upstream open source dependencies are maintained correctly and we contribute everything in the upstream. As a part of that, we develop new projects that uh, enable new capabilities uh, in container tooling that, that run on Azure or anywhere else. Uh, and, and so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how we came up to creating a new project uh, called Gatekeeper. Uh, and that's the subject of the talk today. Uh, unfortunately, I'm up here by myself. You don't see Torin standing next to me because due to the change in schedule, uh, Torin had a conflict uh, at this hour uh, that he wasn't able to get out of. So he sends his apologies for, for not being here. I'm also feeling the pain uh, of this uh, because what you'll find in the discussion today is that I understand policy fairly well. I have a fair amount of experience with it. I, however, am not an export, expert in open policy agent on which this gatekeeper project depends. So, you know, we can, we can only go so far in the discussion. So if we have questions uh, that come out of this discussion that need to get deeper into open policy agent, Torin is here uh, at the conference. Uh, and, and we can find him tomorrow uh, to, to dig deeper into those, those questions. I'll also share uh, other ways in which we can collaborate online and through the community to uh, get questions answered uh, further. So without further ado, I'm not used to these. Let's try that. Nope, wrong way. Okay, I already answered who I am. I want to know a little bit about who you guys are. Um, you know, I, I, I want to show of hands here, who, uh, who here is uh, a developer building applications that run on container infrastructure or Kubernetes or other, other places here? I, I, I do some of that. Anybody else? Okay. That's great. It's about two-thirds of the audience. Okay. Who here uh, operates Kubernetes clusters for those developers uh, as an infrastructure provider? Me too. Okay, there's some of the same hands, but also some different. That's not too much of a surprise. Uh, who here is here because they're uh, responsible for security audits in their organization? Anybody? Yes, a couple. That's fantastic. So uh, I am not, but uh, I've worked with many people like you. So um, I think we're, we're gonna be able to have a real good conversation here. So uh, some of the motivation uh, for the work we've done uh, is reflected in this URL, which is actually kind of interesting uh, if you go and take a look. I'm not going to dig too deeply into it, but it's basically documentation of a number of horror stories for what has gone wrong for some people when they're running Kubernetes clusters uh, in production for uh, big environments, and or, or small, or basically anytime you're trying to do anything real uh, in, in a container orchestrated environment, you, you you can always shoot yourself in the foot. And so these kinds of tools that we're going to talk about are uh, intended to reduce the risk of those kinds of problems coming about. So so let's kind of paint the scenario for a minute. So 
when we all got started building our clusters, we very carefully planned out how people were going to use them, right? We, we, we generated all of our RBAC. We configured it so that everything would work. You know, only the right people could have access to the right namespaces that, you know, it, essentially you, you, you think that you've got everything planned out. You've got run books, you've got ways to handle errors, backup and recovery, all that stuff is ready to go. Let's ship it. Let's open it up. All of a sudden the developers come and they start doing stuff, right? Uh, and, and, and very quickly, um, I suspect that some of you in this audience may recognize some of these questions. Uh, has anybody here ever looked at their cluster and said, where did that namespace come from? Has that ever happened to anybody else? I, I, I yeah. Uh, and then you look in the namespace and you're like, well, there's a whole bunch of pods there. What, what are they? Anybody else? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then you look in the pods and you see, well, what containers are running there? Oh my God, what, what is that container and where did it come from? Like, <laughs> seriously, like who, who decided to pull from that particular repo? Like, how did we manage to get there? And then, you know, what do I do next? What happens if I delete this? Like, who's going to care? Is anybody going to care? Is the production system going to go down? Uh, you know, what's the impact of that? So, you know, you, despite your best plans, you know, you have to make things available to developers. They have to have some freedom to move. So you, you, you can't lock everything down from an RBAC perspective completely or you're, or you're going to end up in the same old, you know, old space where things, you know, developers couldn't do things they need to do. So the question is, you know, how can we address these problems? So um, actually I'm going to kind of skip over the slide because the previous one really did this. So, you know, essentially, when you've got a dynamic environment, you've got all kinds of things happening at the same time. Lots of teams have kind of conflicting goals. You're trying to share resources so that you're not paying too high the administrative costs or too high an in infrastructure cost. Uh, and, and then you've got complex things where you're doing similar things, but not maybe not even exactly the same, but across multiple infrastructures, right? Maybe different clouds, on-prem, in a public cloud. Uh, and things kind of start getting pretty crazy, right? So how do you limit the use of unsafe images. How do you keep track of who created what resources and understand the purpose of those resources and who depends upon them? How do you keep users from running into each other besides namespaces, right? Namespaces aren't quite enough there. How do you make sure that you've got the right uh, tooling in place to create observability about what's going on in there? And, and how do you manage the cost? So, you know, those are all the kinds of questions that, you know, in my experience, everybody runs into on day two of, of running their cluster. Like, day one is fine. Day zero is good. We've kind of got that pretty well solved, or at least the cloud providers do. You know, what, what happens next? So, lots of things happen. Like, we, we all solve problems on a day-to-day -day basis by using common tools that we, we use every day, right? So the first thing to do is to write things down. Like when you do something, make sure that you document what you've done. Like you create these wikis, you put them in spreadsheets, you, uh, you know, there's a million different ways that we can try to do that. The challenge there is how do you get people to do that? Like nobody wants to write it down. I, I created my YAML. So Yes, sure. Oh, is it too hard to hear? Okay. So the question then, sorry, this. The question then is how, how do you make it easy for people to accomplish the documentation of things without having to go into a separate manual step to write things down? And then how do you deal with the limitations of RBAC, right? So, like, I only have a certain limited set of vocabulary for the verbs in RBAC. And you, know, you can extend 
that. Uh, but that's a slow process of going through the community to define, you know, what do we all mean by role-based access control, right? It, it, we've got a fairly solid definition of what that is today, but extending that is a slow and, and cumbersome process, and RBAC is probably the wrong mechanism for, for accomplishing controlling some of these other things. So, you know, it, we can maybe agree that, that neither of these approaches really completely solves the problem. You can, you can do some pieces, but you're always going to have holes there. So Kubernetes has additional capabilities built into it uh, on top of, you know, once you've authenticated somebody, you know, who, who are they? Are they allowed uh, to access? Uh, th this is all the domain, right, of RBAC. Then you've got admission control. Right? So within admission control, the first thing that happens is for that person, are they reaching their resource quota limits? Right? Can't, do we have the resources? Are they allowed to create new things? That's great. And then we've got this thing called the webhook. The webhook then has access to all of the metadata about the object that somebody is trying to create here and can implement rules using an external controller. Right? So what this controller does is it allows you to write very powerful rules to define what can happen in that cluster for a given object, for a given operation, right? So I'm, I'm trying to do something to change an object in Kubernetes. Is that allowed? That's a very powerful concept that I can do that late in the process. And then all the key thing here is that all of this gets reflected in the end in the state of all the objects in the cluster. Right? And, and so all of these things happen before it gets reflected in etcd. And so th this is an important principle that uh, I love that we as a community built into to Kubernetes. The next thing is, well, if we try to use this, it then allows us to have access to all of that metadata about the objects. And then I can build in to these uh, admission controllers all kinds of policies, right? Because I have access to all that data. I can block privileged containers. I can say certain people in certain contexts can, can create privileged con uh, containers, and in other contexts, they cannot be created. I can, in certain contexts, block the use of certain image registries. I can assure that egress rules are only used in certain places, and so forth. Right? There's, there's a, essentially an arbitrary set of combinations of rules that are then possible to implement through this ingress controller mechanism. The challenge is that you have to create ingress controllers in order to do that. And it turns out that that is very hard, right? If you, you're essentially just writing a, a new controller in Go. And uh, for people who love to do that, that's awesome. The, the challenge is that uh, it's not very portable. Uh, you end up creating uh, controllers in general that are uh, purpose-built to solve the problem that you have today. And uh, the policies actually end up changing over time. And the challenge is that you don't want to have to go to a developer to say, I want to change the resource quota from X to Y or I want to allow additional namespaces to have additional quota. Right? These, those kinds of things don't make sense to encode in, in your code. So they need to be flexible and parameterized for different environments, and they need to take advantage of external data. So you could write a controller that goes and queries some external system, like an accounting system or an audit system, to, to make a decision. That's great, but then you also have to think about other use cases, like. Uh, what if I want to make sure to validate all of my policies as I change them, and I want to do them in kind of a CI system? So I need a dry run mechanism and all those kinds of things. That's great. All of a sudden, it starts looking like uh, a very sort of custom set of code. That's not something that we all want to maintain or develop by ourselves. So I want to take a look now at uh, a solution, and that solution is Gatekeeper. 
So we're going to do that in the form of a recorded demo because nobody wants to watch me type. Bear with me while I get that up. Okay, very slow. So, what is Gatekeeper? Gatekeeper is an open source project which uh, you can find on, on GitHub. It has, uh, on, on the GitHub repo, it has very straightforward installation instructions. Uh, you'll find that it's implemented as a set of uh, Kubernetes controllers, right? Uh, resource definitions. Uh, and you can simply use the, uh, the script to deploy those. And what you see is we've created a set of objects in the namespace gatekeeper system. And uh, it's, it's going too fast for me. So we, we essentially ap applied a set of resource definitions. Those resource definitions created controllers in the controller namespace. And now we're going to walk through what it looks like to use gatekeeper. Uh, so let's look at what. CRDs got created, it created two, one for the configs and one for the templates. We'll look at the importance of that uh, in a few minutes. This is a validating webhook configuration, so it's a standard way of configuring the, the webhook. Uh, and we take a look at that, you'll see here that it's, look, it's an admission webhook controller and it's implemented in the gatekeeper system and it applies essentially against a set of resource resources that are coming in through the kubernetes api so in this demo uh, we've got a sample bank there's a, a, it's a, a web native bank and they've implemented kubernetes and they've opened up to the world so my developer now can go and create some system and they created a namespace and they created a bunch of objects in that namespace and then their project kind of, moved, they moved on to another project and then we found this namespace. We're the administrators and, and we're like, well, who created that? Let's take a look at it and, you know, this, this is, we all kind of, some of us raised our hands, you know, we've, we've found namespaces, we don't know what they are, we have to go talk to a bunch of people, it can take quite a long time and eventually we find that somebody created this and then they moved on to it and this is not dependent on it in any way. So, how do we say never again? Like we're not gonna allow that to happen anymore. So, there's a set of templates in this demo that we walked through and the important one here that we're gonna look at first is that we're gonna require labels. So that's a template for rules for requiring labels and then there's constraint for the labels. And we'll apply all of those constraints. Uh, let's take a look at, we're gonna look at one of the constraints here. Here it is. So in the constraint, we're gonna say, all new namespaces must have an owner. Right, so it's a, it's a constraint of kind required labels. And we're gonna say all namespaces must have an owner. And the owner must fit a standard template, in this case, implemented as a regex. So once we apply that constraint to the system, the next time the developer comes back and says, okay, I'm just gonna create an arbitrary namespace, they can narrow back. You can't just create a namespace, you also have to label it, right? So the, the awesome thing about this is that I, I can just simply create a user-friendly message so they, they understand what they've actually done wrong. So this is a properly formed namespace that's got an owner label associated with it that matches that regex. So now I can create that namespace. And um, now what I'm gonna show is how you, uh, you know, we're gonna try to create uh, another set of resources that have no limits, that violates another policy. Uh, that the, or the limits are too high. And we get another message that show, that's very clear about what policy I've, I've uh, violated. In this case, I'm pulling containers from the wrong image repository. It tells me, sorry, you're not allowed to do that. So here, 
is another example of where I'm looking at, uh, let's see, this one is about duplicate service. I say, this is a policy that says, if you're gonna create a new resource in a namespace, it can't have the same name as another resource in that na same namespace. And so we've tried to create a duplicate one and we got back a very meaningful error there. So eventually the developer figures out through what those pol the po implementation of those policies, they get their application up and running and everything's well until something goes down. Let's go back for a second here. Skip something important. So they finally get their service up and running and everything's going great and we never, so why did their system go down? In this case, we do a root cause analysis uh, and something, you know, a common practice for all of us developers is that we're, we're lazy, but we also know that we want to be taking the latest patches and making sure that uh, we're using the right latest image. So we often resort to using the latest image tag. Like that's a, has anybody else ever like done that? I use latest way too much. Well, it turns out that often the latest has a whole bunch of stuff that we don't yet support or can cause unforeseen circumstances. And it turns out that that's often a cause when you do a root cause analysis of a big outage. So let's say maybe what we want to do is actually uh, not allow the use of the latest image. So now let's look a little bit under the hood. There are two pieces to implementing uh, policy with Gatekeeper. One piece is the template. So this is something that the administrator would create. The template, this is a template called Kubernetes Band Image Tags. And what it does is it implements this deny rule. The deny rule, this is actually an open policy agent uh, syntax. And uh, open policy agent actually does the work of uh, enforcing uh, the policies for Gatekeeper. It says, you know, I, I look at these attributes of the input, I find the, the spec, I pull out the image label, and I say, let me get a, a variable and compare that variable to the image label, and if they don't ma if they match, then this is a band label, right? So here you'll notice it's not specified that the latest tag is the one. So next we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna look at the, uh, template. So this is the actual uh, object that is the variables or the constraints applied to that template. So when it, what, the, what the constraint did is it said up here, I can see that when I look at the labels, it, the, the label that I'm trying to match is the latest tag. So right up here. Right, so I'm trying. I'm looking at the latest tag, and I, that's the tag that I want to ban. And so here I'm actually looking at the object. It might be more. It, it's easier to see in the constraint, but the constraint is actually a very simple object. Uh, and that's essentially the end of the demo. So let's take a look under the hood. How how did that work? Switch back. So how did we get to this? So when we looked at the demo, we noticed that there were a couple of things there. There's a template that implements the, the uh, semantics, which is in a language called Rego, R-E-G-O, the open policy agent understands. And so some class of users, we call them administrators, but some class of users needs to understand the, the Rego semantics. And then there's another class of users that needs to understand the policies you actually want to implement using those semantics, right? So those those are more the the uh, you know the the admins who care about what the resource limits are or which tag shouldn't be allowed. So the way it works is happily uh, as Kubernetes objects. So Gatekeeper implements Open Policy Agent as a set of CRDs 
those CRDs uh, are watched by OPA via Gatekeeper, uh, and it watches through the API server all of the objects it created through the API server, implements this webhook, admission webhook, and allows me to do a review through the webhook of everything, and it runs a query against OPA to apply those constraints to the, poli to the policy templates. Essentially, the template ends up generating the policy in OPA. And um, like I said before, it essentially exposes all of the metadata of every object type that goes through the admission controller. Uh, and, and so in this way, we now have essentially a cloud-native way of enforcing policies. So some people have rightfully asked, well, what's, you know, why Gatekeeper? Why, why don't I just implement everything in Open Policy Agent? Open Policy Agent is a very powerful cross-context policy engine that's been used for all kinds of different control systems. And so the fundamental difference is that uh, in OPA, you essentially load all the policies via config maps. Config maps are traditionally very hard to kind of maintain over time in, in clusters. And um, there's, you know, essentially in, in OPA, there's no library of standard policies. You have to essentially write your Rego from, from scratch. Uh, there's, there's no clear way to do reuse or sharing of that. Uh, and uh, that's not exactly the way we, we want to standardize, uh, standardize that across multiple clusters or m multiple environments. So what we did with Gatekeeper is that we turned these into custom resource definitions so that you can manage policies as objects. Uh, the, t the way that happens is this combination of the templates which we looked at, which contain the metadata you want to extract and the Rego semantics, uh, and then the constraints, which are put together with that template to, to create the instances of those CRD policies. And then the project includes, you know, part of one of the things that we're building up through Gatekeeper is a, a library of standard policies, so standard templates and constraints that you can then go and fork and modify and use them uh, for your own purposes. Another feature that we added to Gatekeeper is uh, intended to make it easier uh, for companies to get from point A, where we are today with, say, no policies implemented, to point B, uh, I'm completely in compliance and all of my policies are enforced without killing your developers or your administrators. So the first step in that is to understand in my existing environment what objects conform to my policies and which ones are out of compliance. So we implemented an audit capability. That audit capability allows me to periodically look at all the objects in my clusters and evaluate them against all of the set of uh, policies I have in place and that report is then generated as uh, an audit against the CRD. Uh, this allows me to say, over time, I'm gonna start by auditing and understanding where I'm out of compliance, and then I may either tune the policy, because I may decide that something should be allowed in my policy, and then eventually I'll start enforcing so that all new objects uh, have to conform to that policy. And so this allows sort of an easier on-ramp, uh, which is a very, very important thing in a lot of environments. Other environments, obviously, you may want to uh, enforce them right away. So where are we in the life cycle of this project? So this project is uh, in the alpha stage. We, it's working great. We've got it. I can actually say that we use it. I'm at Microsoft, and we use it to implement uh, the Azure policy for AKS. So we actually have a, a preview service running uh, in Microsoft leveraging exactly this technology. Uh, we also have um, 
other vendors who are using this technology uh, in their environments. And what we're doing is we're trying to build, we're at the stage where we're trying to build the community around this. So we need uh, more hands who care about this to come get involved and uh, give us feedback and, and participate in, in the development of it. So there are new things that right now are on the horizon. Uh, right now, we don't support mutating webhooks. So the next thing that we're looking at doing is doing things like, well, if somebody requests something from the Docker registry, maybe I want to point them to my private registry, for example, right? Without, in a silent way, so they don't have to worry about it, right? So mutating web, webhooks are one thing. Another is that uh, the, you know, we do replicate the data from etcd back into Open Policy Agent so that we can do comparisons across multiple clusters, for example. That will also be useful for comparing against external data so that you can use additional context in your policies. So that's another piece of work. We're also working uh, with SIGAuth on authorization uh, and using IOPA with authorization. It's likely to not actually be a part of Gatekeeper, but a separate project. Uh, the audit right now is essentially an initial tack at it. Uh, we, we have a lot of feedback that we need more capabilities there. Right now, Gatekeeper has very limited uh, metrics and observability. We know it needs more maturity there. And right now, there's no tooling around uh, creating the, the policies. You, there is a dry run, so I can create a set and kind of locally test uh, whether or not my policy uh, is well formed and, and what, you know, what objects don't work, but we need to do more there to make it easier. I want to quickly say thank you to the community of people who have been the core of getting started uh, with Gatekeeper. Uh, it's a, you know, a very interesting cross-section of people across a number of different uh, organizations, uh, including Google, Microsoft, Red Hat, and, uh, and many others. So how do you get involved? This is a very important slide. Uh, you come to the Slack, so please join the Slack community uh, for uh, Open Policy Agent. There's a Kubernetes policy group, and uh, you know, come submit your issues and keep track of what's going on through OPA Gatekeeper. Uh, right now, the meetings for the community aren't at a very uh, Asia-friendly time, uh, but that's something we're looking at fixing. I, I'm pushing for having a Europe-friendly time and an Asia-friendly time uh, in North America. So mornings or nights, my time. Uh, and that is the end of my presentation. I, I think we have one minute for questions. If there are, or I'm happy to hang out afterwards for any additional questions. Are there any questions real quick? No? Well, OK. Oh, there is one question. Yeah. We're trying to do something like uh, we're using like EKS, uh, uh, AWS. We're trying to use like KIAM. I wonder if if um, this can replace KIAM in terms of like roles. I I, I don't know a hundred percent because I don't know KIAM. I know IAM, uh, and I assume KIAM essentially just extends that. Okay, to, to, so uh, in theory, I think the answer is yes, we should test out that use case. So uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you guys very much. I really appreciate your attention. And